All right, good evening, everybody. We're gonna give you just a few minutes. One moment. All right, so while you wait for us to get started, there is a QR code on your screen. If you'll go ahead and scan that QR code, it will take you to our Mentimeter site. You can go ahead and scan that. I see we have a few people successfully getting in. You should see a little thumbs up. As a matter of fact, I like to scan in myself so I can make sure I'm experiencing the same thing everyone else is experiencing at the same time. Great, so on your screen, you should see the same thing on your mobile device. You can use a cell phone or an iPad or some other uh, tablet or mobile device. You'll wanna go ahead and scan the code. You should see the same code that you see on your computer and a thumbs up at the bottom. If you hit that thumbs up, it'll let us know that you made it in. And we'll give it, whenever we use Mentimeter, we try to give it a few minutes so people can get in the door and get scanned in. So we will get started in about 60 seconds. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, so I think we have um, just about half the, more than half the folks are signed into Mentimeter. So I'll go ahead and get started. I will say this, I've got someone from staff that's gonna drop the link uh, into the chat so that for those of you that are not able to scan the QR code, you can type in www.menti.com it will ask you for an eight digit code, which staff is putting into the chat right now. Again, that's www.menti, M as in Mary, E as in Edwards, N as in Nancy, T as in Thomas, I as in Isaac.com. If you go to www.menti.com, you can go right ahead and enter that eight digit code that we will put in the chat and you can then join us where we are on Menti. If for some reason you are unable to get in, please do not worry about it. We have so many ways this during this CDP update, we have so many ways of collecting feedback. So it's okay if you're not able to, to link up with us on Menti, no worries at all. We'll still get your, your input, all right? Okie dokie. So um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Leah LaRue. I'm the director of neighborhood planning units for the city of Atlanta's Department of City Planning. I would like to welcome you to our MPU University Introduction to Comprehensive Development Planning class. This is our uh, a class in our planning track. Our MPU University has four tracks and this class is in our planning track. It's P1007. If you are taking this class for um, credit, 
for uh, the Citizen Planner Certificate Program, or if you're taking the class for um, the training incentive for the Community Impact Grant, or for any other reason, we're very, very glad to see you here. And again, the course for your records is P1007. I'm joined tonight by several of my colleagues. We are doing um, the, the course a little bit differently tonight, or if you've been to our classes before, you know that we ordinarily uh, do classes in, in an interactive manner. We will be interactive uh, tonight, even though we're doing it webinar style. That is just because of the size of the class. And we wanted to make sure that we are able to hear from everyone in a timely manner and that everyone has um, the ability to get all of the information that we want to share. So I am joined tonight by our MPU University Registrar and Program Coordinator Senior for Training and Education Initiatives, Samantha Terry, also joined by our Program Operations Manager, Ida Santana, and several of our other um, employees and coworkers, colleagues from the Department of City Planning. All right, so we start off all of our classes with our classroom rules. Uh, please keep your microphone muted, although I think in this uh, webinar format, this is less of an option anyway. If you have, if you don't have a pen or paper or something to take notes with, this is a really good time to go ahead and grab a notebook and a pen or whatever note-taking devices you use so that you can keep notes. Every single class we have, people ask us, um, are we going to get the presentation after <laughs> the answer has always been yes. The answer is still yes. You will receive a copy of the presentation uh, at the end of the class. You'll also receive a survey, but we'll talk more about that at the end of the course. If you're one of those like me that likes to snack during a class, uh, this is a good time to grab your snack, especially if you've already heard our classroom rules and you know them by heart. Go ahead and grab your note-taking devices and your snack now. Um, we do ordinarily require folks to keep their cameras on to receive course credit. Again, this is a webinar format, so that is a little less relevant. If you have questions related to the course content, please do enter it in the Q&A. We will be, we have a number of staff members that are, as you can see, I'm in the office. We have a, a few staff folks that are here uh, logged into the class and we'll be answering some of the questions as they come in live in the Q&A. Other questions we may answer um, out loud or at the end of the class during the Q&A section. So we'll try to get as many questions answered as we possibly can. We do have an email account for additional questions that we don't get to tonight and tons and tons of engagement. So many, many opportunities to get all of your questions answered. I will point out our golden rule for every single MPU University class is that all questions must be relevant to course content. Every question that you ask should be specifically relevant to the information that we're sharing with you tonight. All right, thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna get started with a little warm up to make sure that everybody who is attempting to use Mentimeter can get a little practice in and know how to use it. So first question, how well do you understand Atlanta's comp plan? If you're kindergarten level, maybe this is your first time, engaging in the process, or maybe you're new to Atlanta, you're new to comprehensive planning period, you might want to select kindergarten level. I think I'll go ahead and select that one myself. <laughs> um, if you know a little bit about comp planning, maybe you've looked at it or talked about it at your MPU meeting or neighborhood association meeting, you can go ahead and select somewhat kind of sorta. If you're somewhere in the middle, you know a little bit, not too much, you can select in the middle, or maybe you're a little bit of an expert. You know quite a bit about comp planning. You'll wanna select very well. And if you think that you should be teaching this class instead of sitting in the classroom somewhere, go ahead and select that one with your chest out. I could be teaching this class. Go right ahead and select that. It looks like only one other person could be teaching this class. I'm tempted to ask our commissioner if she's the one that selected that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a couple more seconds. 
And if you're just joining us, you can uh, go ahead and scan the Mentimeter code that is in the chat, or you can type in www.menti.com, it's M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter code 69961657. I'll say that again, it's www.menti.com and enter code 69961657. It's also at the top of your screen. All right, so this is really exciting. I hope my colleagues will agree. It looks like we have a lot of folks that are at kindergarten level. So I hope that um, all of this material is at a at a nice, comfortable level for you to digest it and learn a little bit tonight. I think we're all gonna learn a little something tonight. All righty. All right, I'm gonna count down from five and then we'll move on. Five, four, three, two, one. Excellent. We have three people that could be teaching this class, by the way. Three folks. Sounds good to me. All righty. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our instructors. I have to say we've been making history since 2019 and technically we've been making history since 1974, if not before that. But this tonight is the very first time that we have our commissioner, the city's chief planning officer to present a class. She is our course instructor. She told us some time ago, listen, I know comp planning. I could teach comp planning in my sleep. So we challenged her to come tonight and teach comp planning in her sleep. She's she's no, nodding off over there. We're going to wake her up and let her teach this class tonight. <laughs> Joined also by uh, my colleague, Nate Hosell, who is the project manager for Plan A, the city's comprehensive development plan tonight. So Commissioner Janae Prince and uh, project manager Nate Hosell, hailing from East Lake neighborhood and Midtown neighborhoods. I am very happy to introduce you tonight Commissioner Janae Prince. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Okay, we got all the mics turned off. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Yes, I was the one who said I could teach this class. And for all of you who also said you can teach the class, happy to have the help. Okay. So let's get started here. We have um, another Mentimeter slide here where we are going to ask you where you live because we are building the beloved community block by block. What, what street are you on? Where are you? I, you know, we've got 149 participants and I'm assuming y'all are from all over the city. So I really would like to see this just to get a sense. I live in East Lake. Um, but I want to know where, where you are. Well, it looks like you're from all over. Um, got some neighbors here, and Leah, you have some neighbors too. I see the NPUX crowd is here. I see Grant Park. I see people from outside the city who care about the city. That warms my heart. Home Park, Buckhead, Cabbage Town. Awesome. Good stuff, West End, Chosewood Park, Venetian Hills. This is great. Well, I'm really glad that y'all came out and uh, came out, came to your computer. I'm right, glad that you're part of the class. We're all in our conference room and doing this together so we can help each other out. So just a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing city planning work for a lot longer than I care to admit. Um, coming up on almost 30 years here. I've done a lot of comprehensive plans. I was a consultant for eight years and traveled around 
doing comprehensive planning. And let me just tell you about comprehensive planning in Georgia. Every city and county in Georgia is required to have a comprehensive plan. And, and this is because of the Georgia Planning Act of 1989. And that law was adopted because we were growing so fast in the 80s that communities wanted to slow down, take a look at things and make sure we had plans in place. Now the Georgia Department of Community Affairs has all the rules, they're the keeper of the rules. And they say we have to update our comprehensive plan every five years. Now you might have noticed that we call ours our the comprehensive development plan, not just the comprehensive plan. And I'll explain why in a minute. But to do comprehensive planning, you really have to look at what's happening in your community. You have to look at the plans that you already have in place. You have to look at your projected population. You have to take a long, hard look at things and you have to bring in the community. Comprehensive planning in Georgia is a grassroots effort and comprehensive plans are long range plans. So 20 years, 20 years time. Now, if you're doing that, it's gonna have to be a high level plan, right? And I know that a lot of you have participated in small area planning processes, like for example, the um, Greenbrier plan. A small area plan is a deep dive into a particular neighborhood. The comprehensive plan is up here, the high level plan, and then we take deep dives periodically into different neighborhoods. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, we have to do a comprehensive plan so we can accommodate growth in our city. What's the first word that comes to mind when you think of growth? Good stuff, you guys. This is all the stuff that our comprehensive plan needs to address. <laughs> well, I got good news about that piece because the city is going to do a comprehensive transportation plan after we finish our comprehensive development plan. And that's great because you know what growth you should plan for and what you need to do about it transportation wise. So that, that's very important. Let's see what else we got here. Good stuff, good stuff everyone, very thoughtful, I like it. So I mentioned the Georgia Planning Act of 1989. It requires that we address certain topics in our comprehensive plan. Now it doesn't say what the content of the plan should be, just that you touch on the required topics, making sure that you are really thinking things through. Now we are updating our plan. We were supposed to update it during the pandemic, but because we couldn't do the community outreach that we would have liked and is required by law, uh, we had to do just a minor update and it pushed us out a little bit and we have to do this larger update now. So, during this update, we will not address every single required element, but we will get to the ones that you think of most, which are going to be things like the land use and the neighborhood planning, and probably we'll touch a little bit on housing and a little bit on transportation. And that transportation information will feed to the comprehensive transportation plan. Now, also listed here are other things that have to be in a comprehensive plan in Georgia. A community work program, that's a to-do list. It's a to-do list for the city. So 
if we need to do a deep dive into a particular neighborhood, a small area plan for that neighborhood would appear in the community work program, okay? We also have to report back to the Department of Community Affairs what our accomplishments have been since the last time we did a conference plan. Now, that's important. The State Department of Community Affairs really looks at if you implement your plans. They keep this in mind when they're deciding about state grants. So be good, implement your plan. There's also the capital improvements element. Now, not every comprehensive plan has a capital improvements element. We do because we assess impact fees on new growth. The capital improvements element is a list of capacity building projects to accommodate that growth. Okay, I hope that wasn't too super technical. Next slide, please. Okay. So there are only a limited number of states that require comprehensive planning. Some states don't. The more successful economically, the states that are more successful economically require comprehensive plans. And it's important to have them because it creates an environment of predictability for anybody who wants to invest in the community. So if you're going to buy a house, don't you wanna know what the plan is around you? Don't you wanna know what's planned to happen near where you're going to make what is probably the largest investment of your life? I do, I want to know. Also having a comprehensive plan is very helpful for companies that are looking to invest here to bring jobs or to build buildings. But what I really like best about comprehensive plans is it takes your vision Remember I said there's a lot of community involvement. It's a grassroots effort. It takes the citizen's vision, puts it all into one document, and it communicates what you want to your elected officials. When I was a consultant going from place to place and doing comprehensive plans, I used to say that there were three questions in comprehensive planning. What do you want? Where do you want it? You put all that into a draft document and go back to the community and say, do we hear you right? Did we get it right? And then you fine tune that document, that draft document, that draft comprehensive plan based on the reaction to it. So it's your vision, your ideas, your chosen development patterns, your goals and objectives all in one document. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's an example of who's using the comprehensive plan. Like I said, it creates an environment of predictability, right? So you're the business owner or you're a developer and you're thinking about where you want to build your project. You want to know what the plan is. You're probably going to ask for rezoning. So you want to know what the plan is so you have a sense of whether you have a chance to get that zoning or not. Now I know that all of you NPU members are looking at the comprehensive plan when you are making a decision on your recommendation on a rezoning application. The staff does that too. The goal of the staff is to implement the plan and we do that through the zoning ordinance. So it guides our recommendations on rezoning applications. Next slide, please. Okay, here you go. How's the comprehensive plan implemented? Capital improvements, that are, those are those projects, the high top dollar, big ticket item projects that you're gonna be asking for in this process. Like we need sidewalks over here. We need transit over here. We need some more parks. We need some more street trees. The big ticket items. The small area plans. You might be thinking, well, Janae, you know, we really need to take a deep dive into this particular neighborhood. Maybe the 30,000 feet, 30, feet view isn't good enough. We need to get to the 3,000 feet view 
on this one particular area because it's changing so fast and we really need to look at it. The community work program is the to-do list. It's in the back of most comprehensive plans. Every community has one and it's things like, let's do a small area plan, let's build some sidewalks, let's come up with a program to allow sidewalk dining, let's try to get more street trees, let's build some trails, things like that. And then at the micro level, at the parcel by parcel level, those zoning decisions that are made every, every council meeting, um, implement the plan. Next slide, please. There you go. I think we have this one twice. Next slide, please. Okay, here's what's important here. The comprehensive plan is a long range plan. It's high level. And I wouldn't just say community supported. What I would say is that it comes from the community, right? Because it's a grassroots planning effort. We're not coming to you telling you what should be in the plan. We're just coming to you saying, we need to address these topics. We'd like to hear from you on them. Next slide, please. So here's the distinction between the comprehensive development plan and the zoning ordinance. The comprehensive development plan is the plan. The zoning ordinance is the law. The zoning ordinance is the law that implements the plan. Next slide, please. All right, y'all, quiz time. Let's see what you got. Which statement is true? Okay, y'all, comp plans are required in the state of Georgia and city ordinance requires them. Yeah, yeah. But to those who said comp plans are not actually required, they're not required nationally. It's a state by state thing. And in my opinion, the most uh, economically successful states are the ones that require them because they're the ones that are thinking ahead, have a plan, have a vision. Okay, so I've told you about comp plans in general. Let's go on and talk specifically about Atlanta's plan. So you see here, there's a quote from Mayor Maynard Jackson from the 70s. Under Mayor Jackson's administration, the city did its first comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. We did our first comprehensive development plan in 1975, y'all. We're ahead of the curve. They Comp plans weren't required until 1989. We did it first. Round of applause. All right, yeah. So I'd like to know, have you ever used the comp plan at an NPU meeting or for anything else? Okay, I'm pretty surprised about this because the comp plan is your plan. 
I am a professional city planner. And when we go out to do a comprehensive plan, it's not my plan, it's your plan. We're coming to you to find out what you want for the future for your community. And when you tell us, we're gonna write you a plan to get it. You would be surprised how many people share a common vision about what they want for their neighborhood. You would be surprised. Okay, next slide, please. All right, what else is different about Atlanta's comprehensive plan? We have the Atlanta city design. Nobody else has this. This is a very important visioning document for us aspiring to be the beloved community. Next slide. Okay, so this is great. And this kind of spells it all out, y'all. The visioning document that we did a few years back, the Atlanta city design, it sets a framework for us. We really started to get an idea of what y'all want for your community. And this makes it easier for us to come out and do the comprehensive plan because it helps us know to know what questions to ask you, okay? So we're gonna come out and do this comprehensive planning process with y'all and write this comprehensive plan to capture your vision to communicate to our elected officials. And once the comprehensive plan, the CDP is adopted, then we use that in our decision-making for zoning and building and budget decisions. And the end result is a wonderful city built according to our vision. Our, all of us. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna hand off to Nate here because Nate is the project manager for the comprehensive plan update. And he's gonna walk you through the process that we're going to use. And I'm gonna stick around and answer questions. Um, Nate, take it away. Thanks, Commissioner. Hello, everyone. I'm Can you hear me now, everyone? Thumbs up. See little floating thumbs? Yes, all right. Sorry, everyone, I apologize. I look like a telemarketer now. Um, but I am here to, to talk about the upcoming planning process, which we just started. Um, over the next few months, we'll have a lot of activities and I'm gonna walk, them, walk through them here over the next few slides. But we are, as the commissioner said, uh, looking at all of the planning elements in the comprehensive development plan, our plan A. And we're breaking us out into chunks over the next 18 months. And we're focused over the next few months on land use and neighborhood planning. Later in the year and into 2025, we'll touch on transportation, housing, and the other elements. Next slide, please. So over the next month, there'll be orientations such as this education um, tonight with the MP University. Uh, we have our website, launched at atlantaforall.com. We also have a citywide kickoff event at Greenbrier Mall, 5 p.m. on February 29th. And here it's a very uh, casual open house to meet with our neighbors, to get a sense of what our uh, neighbors are, look are looking at and want as a... Uh, a okay. Okay, <laughs> uh, so this is a casual open house to allow people to come in, talk to us planners. Uh, what would they like to see what, in the future in their neighborhoods, preferred development patterns, different types of land uses in our neighborhoods. It's really an opportunity just to kick off the event in a, in a nice casual atmosphere. Again, that's February 29th at Green Buyer Mall and more details are on our website and also in our future outreach over the next several days. 
Next slide. So after our kickoff on February 29th, a few weeks later, starting around mid-March, we're going to have our first round of community open houses. This is where our neighbors, you can come and talk to planners again and focus, uh, focus uh, over boards and maps to talk about those development patterns again, those types of places you want to see in your neighborhood, where they should be. We'll have maps. You can post uh, your ideas on maps. Discuss goals and ideas of your vision as part of this comp comprehensive planning process. And that deliverable after the first round is the first draft of the land use and neighborhood planning elements. Next slide. We'll come back to you, the community, through another round of community workshops in May and June. Following the commissioner's lead, you know, asking those questions, um, did we get it right? When we talked to you at our last community open houses, did we get it right? Does it look good on the maps? What could be changed? What can be tweaked? And at the end of those community workshops will be a second draft for further review and comment and refinement. Our goal is to be in every neighborhood planning unit between round one and round two. We'll come to you in one MPU, the next night, another MPU. But all of these meetings are open to everyone throughout the city. We're just having the opportunities for us to host meetings in each MPU during these uh, upcoming months. In the fall, we'll start having other types of community involvement, other types of activities of engagement, uh, other meetings to talk about the other elements going into the winter and the spring months. These elements, when you open up plan A, are all organized the same way. They're organized starting with a vision and goal statements, descriptions of how they relate to other plans, such as small area plans or other citywide documents, needs and opportunities regarding the various topics, transportation, housing, economic development, as well as specific policy statements and action statements. Those actions, are then weaved into or brought into the community work program as part of our implementing of the comprehensive plan. And again, we're gonna come back out to the, to the neighborhoods during the fall and winter months to, to take a deeper dive into each of those chapters. We know we're gonna get a lot of feedback during the next few months when we're, talking to, when we're focused on land use and neighborhood planning. We know we're gonna get uh, comments about transportation, ideas about housing. All of those are great comments to get now We'll continue to um, collect them and they'll be incorporated. You'll see that input in these um, drafts in the fall for the other elements. So a question I came up with uh, to ask you to wrap up this section of the planning process that's coming up is how can cities support equity in comprehensive planning? Again, as a commissioner um, mentioned, this is a grassroots process. And with that, you know, this should have uh, equity at its core, this planning, this new plan, this updated plan, should be, equity should be at its core. So I'm just curious about what does equity mean in comprehensive planning to you? Participation, different ways of engagement, and then topics such as affordable housing, you know, challenges like access to good transit and transportation. Make sure that the city is aware of what's happening. We have a very robust uh, community outreach uh, initiative to get the word out. Online, mailers and utility bills, word of mouth. We have a public leadership group uh, that has representatives from all of our implementing partners. So really taking a, a uh, and I'll be at my MPU, MPUD every month, giving updates to Jim Martin and everyone else. Um, all the other, all of my other colleagues who have MPUs will have all the latest information to share with you at your monthly meetings. Uh, so we will be there as not only MPU planners, as DCP planners, but also as a resident. Um, so the, we'll definitely get the word out. 
housing, fairness. Those are all great. Thanks. So just a recap, February is our citywide kickoff event. March and April, we're doing a round of community open houses in 12 NPUs. Again, open to the entire city. So if you can't come to the one down your street, maybe the next night you can come to another one on the other side of town. We'll also have surveys and mapping tools online and in person at these open houses. We'll have pop-ups throughout the city. So if we didn't hit your neighborhood, with a community open house. We'll be there in a pop-up at a MARTA station, at a grocery store, at a library. May and June, we'll come back. Hey, did we get this right? First time we talked to you back in March and April. Let's look at a map. Let's roll the maps out, roll up our sleeves and move lines on the map. Those workshops will be in 13 different MPUs. The 13 MPUs that did not um, host the meeting the first round, we'll get their meeting this round. Again, we'll have an updated survey and mapping tool pop-ups and conversations with planners with like me will still be there we'll still be out in the neighborhoods meeting people in their in their um in their neighborhoods and then through the summer months and into fall uh, we'll be showing up the mpu monthly meetings presenting what we heard during the first half of the year we'll have uh, a public review and comment both on the draft one uh may and june july late July through the um, August and September will be a, a second draft. A third draft will come in September, which will be the one that that uh, city council will be reviewing for adoption. Again, this all this work over the next few months is the land use planning element and the neighborhood planning element. We'll start to get into pop-ups and meetings uh, later in the fall and into the winter months for the other chapters of the comp plan. Our goal, our intention is to adopt the entire, to ad adopt the entire document, the complete updated plan A by May of 2025. So I really hope everyone, uh, this was useful. I hope you had a sense of the upcoming planning process, but also this general comp plan 101. I really hope to see everyone at Greenbrier Mall on February 29th. Please visit our website. We're gonna update this website continuously, week by week with new information, recaps, a look ahead. And also you can always email me and our team to plan at plan A at atlantaga.gov. I think we have one more question to wrap it up. No, that's okay. Leah, um, Commissioner, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about comprehensive planning in your neighborhood, uh, if it's your MP university, universe, uh, course. And I hope we can do it again. Um, maybe at different topics, dig a bit, dig a bit deeper into different chapters. Um, but um, I think commissioner and I are both willing to answer any questions you may have. We've got some in the chat. Alrighty, I hope that uh, all of you, thank you for bearing with us through our technical difficulty. We got it figured out. I hope that all of you uh, got a lot of information from this class. And at this time, we're gonna take a few of the questions that are in the chat. Uh, let's see, in chronological order. How does the CDP impact single family when zoning adopts ADUs that basically remove the concept of single family? Commissioner Prince? Or sure, I can take that one. Um, well, well I, I disagree with the premise of the question. Um, I think if I have an ADU in my backyard and, you know, probably at some point I will and have my nephew living there, I don't think that makes my house any less single family. Um, so, so I'm not, um, I think I'm gonna need more uh, context to that question. I think that 
you know, it allows what I would call gentle density, but maintains the character of the neighborhood. And ADUs in our code are limited to 750 square feet, which is the size of a uh, an apartment. So I, I don't see how it changes the character of the neighborhood at all. All righty, thank you so much, Commissioner. What fraction of the CDP is purely aspirational in nature? Ooh, I love this question. So, so you know, um, when I came to do this talk with y'all tonight, I was thinking about comprehensive plans in general and different places I've worked that have done comprehensive plans. And, you know, I would say in some places they're more aspirational than others, right? Let's say you had some place that was, you know, declining in population and they were planning for the new corporate headquarters that was going to locate there. Mm, probably not going to happen. Very aspirational. But I feel like the people in Atlanta really understand what's happening here, have a good handle on things. I think that we do a really good job of working with our NPUs to let them know what's happening in the city. I think that we have a lot of very civically engaged people here who pay attention to what's going on and they have a lot of great ideas. So I think that the people who participate in the planning process are the ones who bring the realism to the plan. Now, obviously, right, we're going to bring some facts like the Atlanta Regional Commission is going to provide our population projections for us so that we know how many new people we need to accommodate. We have a lot of past planning documents. We have a lot of research and we can give all of that information to all y'all and you can base your recommendations to us, your goals and objectives on that information. I would caution all of you to really soak up all the information that's out there for you to look at that we'll be putting up on the Atlanta for All website and the information that we will have at the meetings when we come out to you. So really how aspirational is the plan? That's up to you. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Since the city is also expected to begin the comprehensive transportation plan and a greenways and trails plan, is there a potential that when taken together, this could be considered the city's first unified plan? Ooh, Ooh that's, that's a, a good, good question. question. Oh, Zap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great, great question. question. Um, you, you know, know I, I know, know that to Cab County. County they just did a unified um, comprehensive plan, you know, few, few land use plan, plan and, and transportation plan together. together. And I know that was a really big lift for their staff. I think the city decided to go ahead and pursue land use and transportation as two separate documents, which is the more traditional way of doing things. And it's totally okay. I think that we're going to get a lot of transportation input in this plan, even though we're coming out more for land use and neighborhood planning stuff. But really, it's only logical to talk about what transportation improvements are needed when you're discussing the character of the neighborhood. So you have selected a development pattern that you think works for your neighborhood. Obviously, you're going to have thoughts on the transportation that, that should, should go along, go with, along it. with it. Should, should the, the character, character of the street, street change? change? Should, should we, we have, have a different type of street, street section? Do we need more transit? Do we need more trails? And what we're going to do is we're going to take down all of that input and put it into this document and hand it over to ATLDOT as the basis for the transportation planning effort. It helps them to get started a little bit faster. Awesome. Thank you. Um, revisiting your previous response around ADUs, uh, I understand the high-level ADU concept, but when the ADU is not on a homestead-exempt property, it is basically commercial multifamily. The city needs to and must review the homestead policy as part of these new policies and include Airbnb policies. That's, That's fair. Wasn't it? That's fair. So, um, team, 
let's uh, start with the input and let's record the, these that we have here today so that this can be reflected in the conference plan information. All right, how do you ensure alignment between the CDP and what zoning approves or doesn't approve? Is there a process to review or audit those periodically to ensure those instituting the law are following the plan? Ah, okay. So one of the things that I like to say is that we always recommend with the plan, we when staff is writing a staff report for a rezoning application, we always bring up what's on the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. And we look at the policies and there and the goals and objectives, and we make our recommendation based on those things. Almost always. Every once in a while, conditions change really fast. And you will find that the comprehensive plan in a particular spot after four or five years might be a little bit out of date. Or there's a wrinkle, there's some new factor that we hadn't considered when we were writing the comprehensive plan. And we didn't give you an example. So 15 years ago, had we ever thought about movie studios and the film industry? No, this was a new business type, a new commercial use that nobody had considered. And so of course it wasn't considered in the plan. So when this new industry came to town, everybody had to rethink their comprehensive plans. Um, I remember when I was working on the Fort McPherson plan when I was, when I was a consultant. And this was a brand new thing that hadn't been considered before. So every once in a while, we have to go back to the drawing board when making decisions. But I would say that the vast majority of the time from a city planning standpoint, it's best to follow your plan, but there's always exceptions to the rule. Alrighty, and where do I find the existing small area plans for my neighborhood? Stephanie, they're on our neighborhood website. <laughs> Similarly, where do I see the current zoning plans for my neighborhood? Lastly, can you describe what land use means? Okay, so the city zoning maps can be found on the city's website. Um, I'm not going to be able to take you through that right now, share screen, but you can find it. Zoning plan, not a thing. The future land use map is where we record what development pattern the community wants to have in a particular location. So there's different types of, of development, there's different development patterns, and they're color coded on the future land use map. And they're pretty broad, these classifications, right? So they will say things like um, commercial or mixed use, or we'll say residential, but a certain type of residential, multifamily, maybe a very high density maybe a mix between commercial and residential. But you'll notice that the categories on the future land use map are not the same as the zoning categories. The reason is that in zoning, remember zoning is the law, it's much more detailed. There may be several zoning districts that fit a future land use category, right? So if the future land use category says it's a mix of commercial and residential, there might be three or four different zoning districts that mix commercial and residential together in different ways, right? So very high level, we're mixing commercial and residential, and then you get down in the weeds and explain exactly how we're doing it in the zoning ordinance. Now, one thing I want y'all to know is that we are working on rewriting our zoning ordinance at the same time. Why? So that we immediately have the zoning districts ready to implement the vision expressed in the comprehensive plan, right? So in the comprehensive development plan, we're spelling out 
what development types we want where, and the zoning ordinance will give us the tools to make that plan come to life. All righty. Will the MPU and neighborhoods be provided adequate support, particularly hybrid type meetings to host info sessions? Would you like me to answer that? <laughs> um, well, I can answer the hybrid part. I'll leave the, the rest of the question to my colleagues. But as we announced in a class just last night, we are pausing our hybrid meeting pilot and reviewing all of the data. Uh, preliminarily, I can tell you that the pilot showed us that on average, hybrid meetings had about 90% of the attendees, in some cases, 95% of the attendees online only with a handful of people attending in person. The MPU that had the greatest number of in-person attendance was only about 10 on average. So um, we have paused the hybrid program and we're reviewing the data to see whether or not we'll continue. All right, uh, our neighborhood has a master plan that was approved by the city. How does this plan fit with the city comprehensive plan? Sure, where well, there's maybe two aspects to this question. One is when we, the city adopts a neighborhood plan, it actually amends the comprehensive development plan. So when our, uh, my colleagues in the office of zoning is making a recommendation for a zoning change, they will look at the current comprehensive development plan as well as that adopted neighborhood plan to inform the recommendation. Now for the upcoming planning process, uh, we are uh, combing through, reviewing all the uh, recently adopted small area plans going back five, 10 years. We'll bring a lot of those uh, land use and other types of recommendations uh, to the second round of those community meetings, those community workshops in May and June uh, to, again, uh, as the commissioner uh, pointed out, things may have changed since those neighborhood plans were adopted, but we wanna bring them into the conversation as part of today's uh, discussions about updating the five-year comprehensive development plan. Uh, there's another question here kind of going down about the neighborhood planning chapter. In plan A, that neighborhood planning element focuses on uh, largely the, the neighborhood planning unit system. It talks about uh, improvements, recommendations to improve the MPU system. It talks about how the MPU system informs the planning process and that for back to the 1980s, uh, the comprehensive development plan for the city of Atlanta has included policy statements from each of the NPUs. And those policy statements live in the comprehensive development plan. So that neighborhood planning element is about those um, processes for the neighborhood planning unit system, the MPU policies, as well as moving forward, small area planning uh, work. How can we improve the small area planning process? The other elements like housing, uh, ecology, transportation, those are related to the land use uh, discussions that we'll have. And again, we'll get uh, a lot of feedback about specifically about you know, transit or housing types. But the, um, the focus will be the nexus, the, the connection, the relationship between land use, growth and development and those other uh, city building aspects like housing. Um, so I just wanna kind of highlight that the neighborhood planning element uh, is ne not necessarily about the neighborhood itself in the city, like housing, um, but it's about those processes in the MPU system. Yes, that's Courtney Smith. Great. All righty. The next question we have is what is an ADU? Okay. An ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. What's allowed in the city of Atlanta is a detached 
accessory dwelling unit, no larger than 750 square feet in the backyard. And it's allowed in the R4 and R5A zoning districts. So in some places, they allow accessory dwelling units. That's another dwelling unit besides the main house. Sometimes they will allow, in other places, they allow it in basements, but we do not here. It's a detached unit in the city of Atlanta. How does citywide environmental protection, specifically tree retention and stormwater impact? Oh, um, I'm going to come right back to that question because I don't understand it. One moment. How do ADUs aid in density when so many are used as short-term rentals? Ooh, that's, that's a great, great question. So in a few weeks, we'll be bringing back the short-term rentals licensing ordinance. And the licensing ordinance gives the rules for short-term rentals. So where short-term rentals are allowed, here's the rules. But I don't know if any of you paid attention to the legislation that was proposed by council member Amos to disallow short-term rentals in Home Park. Um, that legislation is being held right now while the short-term rentals licensing ordinance is go waiting, going to be considered just a prediction, I think that when the licensing ordinance is approved, that there may be other ordinances introduced to disallow short-term rentals in certain neighborhoods. Um, this is something you should talk to your city council member about. What do we hold accountable when there are items not done as the CDP directed? Is there a time limit on the work being completed? So we talked a little bit about how much of the CDP is aspirational. And there could be a little bit of aspiration in that community work program because we have staffing and budget constraints in the city. And when things are added to the community work program, they're not checked against a staffing plan and we don't have any knowledge of what the upcoming year's budget might be. So they are only fiscally constrained later. So we, while we try our very best to do every single thing that is in the community work program, there may be times when things are delayed. All righty. Um, do you see or does the plan see a distinction between density as a tool and what Donald Shute calls dense sprawl? Well, Jim, I'm going to have to uh, ask to share that reading because I would love to read it. Um, <laughs> um, but density is just, it's a thing. It's an actual thing in the city. It's not necessarily a tool. The, um, But maybe let, let's have a conversation about that, Jim. I'm, I'm kind of stuck and I'd like to learn more actually about dense pro. I never heard that term. Where is the starting point for acquiring the issues that the comp plan provides solutions? What are some of the department's tools for receiving input or feedback for upcoming development plans? Uh, I, I think uh, maybe this question, maybe this is the right answer or, or near the right answer. But we're, we're, we're not starting from scratch. This planning process, uh, I gave an overview. We're starting with the existing comprehensive development plan. Yes, yes uh, you, me, we, we updated it five years, a few years ago or during the pandemic. Before that, 2016, and before that, 2011. 
there are ideas there that continue to be uh, important and appropriate, but the, the vision, the goals, the challenges we're facing are always emerging, uh, but we're not starting from scratch. We have the existing comp plan. Um, Zach mentioned other planning initiatives going around the city. Those ideas will filter through uh, this planning process. Your small area plans adopted over the years, those are great starting points as well. Um, I think there's a question here about battling uh, a city over the rezoning or parking issues. The comprehensive plan, your small area plans, when I work with my MPUs, you know, go back to them. Re you know, if you need any help, ask me to help read your plan uh, for your neighborhood to find areas in that plan that either support or not support uh, the, the recommendations or the proposals in front of you. Uh, so again, yeah, maybe this is not the super correct answer, but uh, the tools at our disposal is our existing plans, and it's you. Everyone, um, we live in this city every day. We know what challenges, what needs and opportunities uh, we face, and that's why we want to engage you in all different ways over the next several months. Uh, so those are what I would say are our starting points. All right, revisiting a question from a few minutes ago. The question was, how is citywide environmental protection, specifically tree retention and stormwater impact included in the CDP? How are environmental concerns articulated in the CDP? Well, I think we can set some general goals and objectives around these topics in the CDP. I think they need more detailed study and work on them than can go in the CDP. Now, certainly they have to be brought up in the CDP because the comprehensive development plan is foundational to all the other work that we do. So we have to make sure we bring up all of these issues and concerns and goals and objectives. But I think that for very deep detailed studies on these topics, we're gonna have to have uh, a deep dive just for that. What is your best recommendation to MPUs in battling the city over rezoning? Hmm? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. We answered that one already. How does the comprehensive development plan help us get to the city council's goal of 50% tree canopy? Will there be a plan for land use in terms of tree preservation? Okay, y'all, we need an ordinance for that the tree protection ordinance in particular. So we have hired a facilitator to work with all of the groups that have interest in the tree protection ordinance. So it's Michael Elliott from Georgia Tech and he has put together a group of, I believe, I wanna say 20, working group of 20 people. It's, uh, they haven't started meeting yet but it's supposed to be five from the development is industry, five from city staff, five from the tree community, and five from the affordable housing community. And these people will work together on our tree canopy goals. The working group is tasked with addressing recompense and tree preservation standards. So what will come out of this working group will be a set of recommendations for us to amend the tree protection ordinance. You know that we have the 50% canopy goal and that we measure our tree canopy every five years. So we'll be able to judge the effectiveness of the ordinance. I think that we need the power of the law behind this. And although we will certainly state this goal of the 50% tree canopy in the comprehensive development plan, we need an ordinance for this. We need to get down the weeds on this and we're going to do that. That working group will start meeting, I wanna say at the end of February and they will have a series of meetings while they work up the recommendations for us to make amendments to the tree protection ordinance so we can get to that 50% canopy. All righty, and will the new CDP, also known as Plan A, protect our historic districts? Uh, we have an entire chapter 
in Plan A called Historic Preservation, uh, which brings in all the work my colleagues do in, in the Historic Preservation team, uh, the big high level vision, the policies and actions. Uh, in addition, our current land use map actually shows each of the historic districts uh, as part of the character, or the pattern of development uh, throughout the city. So historic preservation has for a long time uh, been a specific chapter in Atlanta's comprehensive development plan, and it will continue to do, be so. Thank you, Nate. Uh, addressing infrastructure issues, for example, flooding as the community in, um, involvement plan, particularly for adherence to consent degrees, what's the path? Uh, I, I think maybe that was the, um, yeah, the-, the community Sorry, the capital improvement plan. plan. The, uh, the impact fee plan. So um, uh, as the commissioner mentioned, one of the implementing chapters of the comprehensive development plan is how do we use our impact fees that we collect um, every year. And uh, there's there's lots of watershed projects, uh, which uh, we get, the planners and DCP, Department of City Planning, get from our colleagues at Watershed. So Watershed has their own capital project and have uh, plans for all of their watersheds. Uh, so we, we ask them for what are you working on over the next five years uh, to include in our implementing um, chapters. Do we have any plans in place for the no borders crisis and people getting dropped off? Uh, I don't know if that's relevant. At the beginning of the meeting, we talked about um, questions being relevant to course content, and I don't know if that's specifically relevant to the CDP. So I'm going to move on to the following question, which is why can't the final decision on zoning licenses, zoning and licenses reside with the neighborhood and NPU. It seems like developers and small interest groups have the upper hand with variances. All right, Mr. Russell, I think we're going to continue that conversation uh, probably in an, possibly in our zoning fundamentals one class. It's probably a little more relevant to that class than to this one. We want to keep the questions here specifically relevant to uh, the CDP. All right, regarding ADUs, do we expect an uptick in variances? Also a zoning class. Um, okay, are we collaborating with any other cities in developing our own plan? Are there any cities we should draw inspiration from? I like this question. I do. I do. I like this question. I, I think that that we need to take our inspiration from our citizenry. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I hear that we had some echo on the sound. I hope we got that fixed. What are your recommendations and referrals in regards to those who would like help with the assistance and advocacy for pre preserving historically Black places in Atlanta, predominantly Black neighborhoods? You can look through questions. The context. Um, sadly, there are many historic buildings and places all around Atlanta that are being demolished or not protected correctly, which serves as significant as a significant part of history in Black neighborhoods. This includes historically Black cemeteries, historic Black hospitals, and other historic places. Uh, that, that's a great question. In fact, my colleagues, again, the historic preservation team, um, have whole programs related to exactly this, this concern of black neighborhoods and historic uh, places. So definitely reach out to me, our historic preservation team, uh, Matt Adams, a uh, great person to contact and um, talk about that specific challenge. And please come to our meetings. Matt and his team will be at our um, meetings across the city. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to talk to 
our experts at Department of City Planning to hear directly from you. How does the CDP steer developers into specific communities for investment, even though those communities may not be the highest demand in the city? The CDP doesn't specifically do that. Um, we have a lot of economic development activities taking place here in the city. And those agencies, Invest Atlanta, for example, do a lot of that economic development work for us. Additionally, we have a small team here in the Department of City Planning that does neighborhood level economic development. You might have heard of our Main Street program, um, working with small commercial districts. So this is the sort of thing that is plan implementation. So if you feel like there are areas that need additional economic development, you need to tell us when we come out and have a meeting in your neighborhood, you need to let us know where those places are and what your vision is for that place so that all of the people who work in economic development can work towards that vision. If the zoning ordinance is the law, how can it better be enforced for the CDP to be effective? Ooh, we spend so much time enforcing that zoning ordinance. We have a whole code enforcement team. And I was explaining today, this afternoon at the uh, CDHS meeting about code enforcement and what are the typical complaints that we get. And I will tell you that the complaints that we get, um, some of them are about the use of property. You'll find, we, I find that we have a lot of complaints about businesses being run out of places that are zoned for residential or people living in places that are zoned commercial. You know, you might be wondering why that's a problem, but it, it is because they're typically living in places without windows or bathrooms or what have you. So um, the zoning ordinance is really a big part of our code enforcement activity. How are impact fees assessed and allocated? I'm gonna give you a real high level on that one. So the idea behind impact fees for anybody who's not familiar is that new growth should pay for itself and that it should pay for its proportional share of the infrastructure that is needed because this particular property developed. Got that? That's, that was a little complicated, but impact fees pay for projects that add capacity to our system, right? So roads, parks, and public safety. That's what impact fees go for. And we maintain a list of projects that are eligible for use of impact fees. And we develop that list in great part because of our comprehensive planning efforts. If an MPU has a community master plan, can it be considered in the CDP for that neighborhood? Yeah, when there is a neighborhood plan adopted by city council and the mayor that amends the comprehensive development plan. And as I stated before, when we are asked to make recommendations to council and the mayor for changing zoning, uh, we refer both to the comprehensive development plan and the small area plan that was adopted. What takes priority in planning, the CDP or the Beltline overlay? Well, I, again, it says this is that... Uh, CDP is the plan, the overlay is the regulation implementing the plan. So they work hand in hand together. The city of Atlanta seems to be more invested in larger scale developments or single family housing. How can we use the CDP to push for more missing middle developments? such as mid-rises, mixed-use properties with retail commercial on the bottom, 
with housing and apartments above in order to provide a better mix of housing and commercial opportunities for all. Well, it sounds like you have an idea of the types of development patterns you want to see more in the city. So I just recommend to coming to our to our activities, our engagement activities, our meetings, and bring that idea uh, to the meetings. Um, we are updating this comprehensive plan uh, now concurrently with the zoning code rewrite. And we want a zoning code that implements the vision that you all bring over the next several months. So if there is that type of idea, please bring it. Uh, and we'll incorporate it uh, into all the other um, input we get from the public. That's one way. How important are neighborhood plans or small area plans in informing the future land use map in the CDP? I think we've already sort of answered that one, Leah. All righty. Is there any way we in the MPU can assist or provide input with the zoning ordinance changes? Well, you sure can. Um, so after we've gone through these CDP meetings, the zoning ordinance meetings will start again. And those meetings will be really well publicized and come on out, come on out and help us. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm coming back to that question. How will this plan address maintaining existing and creating new green spaces? Well, um, just a few years ago, uh, our colleagues, the Department of Parks, uh, did their own master plan for uh, the Parks Department, looking at to the future, uh, where we need new parks to make sure everyone has access to green space, uh, the pandemic definitely brought uh, that issue to the fore. And we now have a very recent um, parks master plan with a capital budget and capital funding for various projects. And so we will be bringing in uh, those great ideas and that work that our colleagues at the Department of Parks into uh, various aspects of the comprehensive development plan in our land use chapter, in our ecology chapter. Uh, so those, those will definitely be brought in um, through the work of, with our colleagues at the Department of Parks. Uh, so I'm going to read this question. Um, okay, never mind. The CDP, and specifically the Beltline Overlay District, espoused the concept of walkable neighborhoods. However, even within the Beltline overlay, when a developer purchases a property that is zoned commercial, developers are simply putting up high density housing with no accommodation of commercial spaces. The question is why are developers not required to include commercial elements when a property is zoned for commercial use? This seems to go against the CDP goal of walkable neighborhoods. Well, um, I think Kieta is teaching Zoning 101 uh, in a few weeks. I think that would be a, a great MPU course. Um, but also going back to the other question, again, the, the comprehensive development plan is the plan, the vision, the policy document, and the zoning code is the law or the regulations to implement it. And if there are development patterns that you want to see more or less of, please come to our meetings over the next few months. Also, I think if you're going to participate in the zoning fundamentals class, if you have a very specific question like that, um, maybe you could prepare for it and ask about the specific property and the specific zoning district. However, y'all know that we are going to be rewriting the zoning code. So the answer that you get may only be helpful for a year or two. <laughs> Thank you so much, Commissioner. When, uh, when, why did MPU policies get moved to the appendix in the most recent update? Because um, they they actually used to be in the uh, an appendix or an attachment or at the end of our older comprehensive development plans. And because of the pandemic, we didn't have all this uh, great engagement. And so we weren't able to um, talk about all the various MPU policies with, with all the MPUs. There's 
hundreds, I think there are 800 policy statements. Uh, and so moving them into the appendix was also a, a production decision that we made as a team uh, to make it uh, clear um, that there are sections that um, have NPU policies and uh, adjacent to the land use maps for each of the NPUs. And that's how predecessors, planning predecessors in this department back uh, several decades ago used to do it. So we just kind of brought that into the, the, the latest comprehensive plan. There are other ways of producing that document better with, uh, I'm more than happy to work with the MPU chairs. Thank you. What comes first, the zoning rewrite or the CDP? Are they tightly coupled or considered separate? Oh, Should I pull the slide back up? The comprehensive <laughs> plan comes first. Why? Because it's the plan. But we have to have the zoning ordinance right afterwards so we have the tools to implement it you know most places they'll work on their comprehensive plan and they'll get it adopted and one of the things in their community work program will be to rewrite the zoning ordinance so that the plan can be implemented and then it takes them seven years to rewrite the zoning ordinance i might be talking about one of our neighboring jurisdictions <laughs> so what we're doing is we're making sure we have the zoning ordinance ready to go to start implementing the vision right away. But technically, CDP comes first. Awesome. How are funds for capital improvement elements distributed throughout the city? Is it possible to know where CIE is funded in my MPU? Are certain elements more of a priority than others? Uh, I believe you can uh, get up-to-date information on location of the CIE projects each year. I think there's a website that kind of shows uh, those projects. And then in terms of a priority, so if it's specific to how we're using impact fees uh, following the capital improvements element, that's a five-year rolling uh, priority list. So every year that, that element, that chapter, the CIE chapter is a is, a, is updated with new projects. Some projects are taken off the list because they were done or no longer relevant. New ones are added. And I think that's every October. Uh, so while we're going through the five-year update this year, um, my colleagues working on the CIE for the upcoming five years, I will also have legislation at the same time. And we'll incorporate the latest uh, CIE element when we adopt the full comprehensive development plan in May of 2025. Okay, sure. also, so I think it's important to point out that there are three service districts in the city. So north, south, and west. And impact fees are spent where they are collected. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Commissioner. Will the CDP address street patterns? It would be nice to have something to fall back on, some sense of direction when people come through with variances for setbacks and such. It would be nice to have some document to show what the vision for the street design and pattern are throughout our neighborhoods. So when you are coming out to these meetings and you're telling us about the development pattern that you would like to have in your community, you're gonna be picking out, you're gonna be looking at pictures and saying, this is appropriate, this type of development is appropriate in this area, on this street. But I think it's also very important to look at the street, right? Because if you're picking mixed use development, say stores or restaurants with apartments above, you probably don't want a six lane road going 50 miles per hour in front of that development type you're probably going to want a different type of street section. Now, while we are not exclusively looking at transportation in this update, we're much more focused on land use. This type of input is very important to us because land use and transportation go together. And if you can tell us what sort of development type you want in a certain area, you can also tell us what type of street section should go there. And we'll be writing all that down and we'll be incorporating it 
into the CDP as much as we are able. And we will be handing it off to ATL DOT for the comprehensive transportation plan. Thank you, Commissioner. Will there be opportunities for clusters of MPUs to meet to discuss development around areas that border multiple MPUs? For example, Pont City Market, which touches MPU E, F, N, and M. Yeah, Debbie, that, I, that's a great idea. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, um, looking at pairing MPUs for um, the various community open houses and community workshops. If there are specific uh, areas like Pont City Market, uh, I'm sure my colleagues and I would be more than happy to have uh, a small discussion, small group discussions via Zoom or in person over specific areas where we definitely will be able to, um, to do that. What types of things won't be honored in a CDP? All right, we're gonna, uh, Corrine, I'm gonna send you a follow-up to get some more information about that question. How does planning for public safety fit in with the comprehensive development planning process? Can I see these questions? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Public safety is so important. And in city planning work, we focus on the built environment. The safest places are places that a lot of people can see. Yeah, I think we have too much background noise here. Okay. The safest places are places that a lot of people can see, eyes on the street. So the design of our communities is very important. Um, when I was in graduate school, I took a class about crime prevention through environmental design. Okay, all you nerdy planner types, you know what I'm talking about eyes on the street. You need to build places that a lot of people can see. You need to have consistent low level lighting. We need to be thinking about preventing crime and designing our communities. All right, will the tree protection ordinance and updated zoning ordinance be aligned? since most of Atlanta's old trees are on single family lots. Yeah, it's a perfect time to get them aligned since we're gonna be rewriting both those ordinances. As a representative of an MPU that borders two other cities, Hapeville and East Point, will there be an effort to coordinate land uses with adjoining jurisdictions? Well, Zach, I, I I don't think that's typically been done with the city of Atlanta. Um, and as we worked at the MPUX small area plan several years ago, I don't believe that was brought up either, but I'm happy to talk offline, Zach, if you have ideas. Uh, but gateways into our neighborhoods that are on the border of the city is always important. When we do our small area plans, it's always been uh, a high priority for the neighborhoods, you know, a sense of place when you come to their neighborhood in the city of Atlanta when you cross the city border. Uh, so I know we'll hear a lot about that, but in terms of specific land use, again, each jurisdiction has their legal right to regulate and plan for their uh, parcels. And so I guess I can just leave it at that. Thank you so much, Nate. Will you consider um, I'm sorry, what are the established best practices that you are referencing to inform your plan development that will not result in further gentrification? My pleasure. What are the established best practices that you're referencing to inform your plan development, our plan, to be clear, it's our plan, uh, that will not result in further gentrification?
Well, there's a there's a lot of ways to answer that or go after gentrification, but the one that I hear a lot is uh, supporting a variety of housing types. You know, diversifying our housing stock has been uh, 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 an idea, uh, a policy recommendation that's been talked about for a while now in this city, and. I would say that's one aspect of reducing gentrification impacts is having a comprehensive plan in the future zoning code to support uh, a variety of housing types. So everyone has access to housing, no matter their income level. Thank you, Nate. Could you explain how neighborhoods are being assigned density guidance from the city? and then how they are at liberty or not at liberty to make decisions about where that density should be reflected. Okay, we're not assigning anything. So we're coming to you to ask you what the development patterns should be in your community, in your neighborhood. And you can tell us, we like to ask these questions with pictures. And the reason we do that is because oftentimes people can't describe to me saying, I would like a building of this many stories with this floor area ratio, with this exact proportion of uses, with these kinds of setbacks. But what they can do is they can point to a picture and say, that is appropriate for our neighborhood. And this other thing over here, this is not appropriate. So we're gonna to come to you and ask you a lot of questions. And you you're going to tell us and we're going to capture that information and we're going to write you a plan to get you the development pattern that you feel is best for your neighborhood, for our city. Those types of decisions, the development patterns show up in the future land use map and you will reference the future land use map of the comprehensive development plan when you are making a recommendation on a rezoning application or our staff will reference that because it all comes from you. Remember, this is a grassroots process. And if I may, I'd like to just um, point out because I always do when I see the word or any reference to neighborhoods making decisions, I just wanted to point out that our neighborhood planning unit system, which is celebrating 50 years this year, uh, submits and makes recommendations to the city of Atlanta, to the city council and the city departments about matters that affect the livability of your neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are not given any power to make decisions, but they make recommendations and those recommendations inform uh, that those recommendations inform the CDP and the CDP informs the work that we do here at City Hall. I just wanted to make that part clear. All right, moving on to the next question. Um, how specific or detailed can a CDP be for an NPU? Um, that's, that's another kind of challenging question, but I think we can get into that a little bit. Nate? Well, the commissioner mentioned at the very beginning of her conversation, comprehensive development plan is 30,000 feet. The small area planning process, we dig deeper at 3,000 level feet. In the comprehensive development plan, the policies and the policy action recommendations are for the city as a whole. We're always looking, again, the comp plan is comprehensive, the whole jurisdiction, but also the land use map because of technology, GIS, geographic information system, you can zoom in to your own parcel to see what the comprehensive plan uh, designates your property. Is it commercial? Is it residential? Uh, we we organize those maps uh, in the city of Atlanta around the 25 MPUs. So uh, that's one way that the um, comprehensive development plan starts at 30,000 feet and helps guide those decisions in your neighborhoods. That's one way is showing the, the land use map. Uh, at a neighborhood scale, an NPU scale. But again, the policies and actions that are in the main document of the city's comprehensive plan is for the, the entire city. Uh, and then again, um, there are NPU policy statements uh, made by each of the NPUs on their own. 
How best do we handle critics of development and density despite the reality of the city's growing population to keep community conversations moving forward constructively? For example, how will this process capture those comments in a way that's not dismissive, but continues the conversation towards change? Well, I, for one, will come to every meeting not dismissing anyone's opinions. Um, that's one way I'm gonna try to manage this project, but I, this is a challenging, uh, this is a question that hits right at the challenge of having a de deliberative democratic process of creating a shared vision for the city's future. Uh, I think it all takes all of us to work. Um, and I guess I would just follow Leah's lead again, 50th year of the MPU system and the MPU system is based on Maynard Jackson's ideal of love. And so we have to be empathetic towards each other uh, during the next few months. And, uh, that's one way, perhaps. Okay, thank you, Nate. How do we strike a balance between our current over-reliance on car transportation in Atlanta and moving towards a more pedestrian-friendly, less, I'm sorry, moving towards a more pedestrian-friendly, less car-reliant future in the CDP? Well, I know that one aspect of the current comprehensive plan and for the comprehensive plan for many years and probably for the future is aligning our transit and our land use patterns that support transit. So that in a nutshell means, you know, greater density around our transit stations is one way uh, to support a pedestrian walkable urban environment uh, versus a car dependent environment. Thank you, Nate. Uh, does the proposed timeline allow adequate time for any effective review? Yeah, so the, the way we have the project scheduled, I mentioned the drafts, uh, the, there will be at least two to three uh, 45 day public review and comment on the drafts just for the land use and neighborhood planning elements. And then another two 45 day public review and comment uh, later in the year and into early 2025 for the entirety uh, the, the entire plan A comprehensive development document. Uh, so we we fully understand that one way to great, get great feedback is for people like you to actually see uh, in writing the policies, to see in writing the maps uh, that us planners took from the public feedback from during our in-person and virtual engagements and, and making uh, time to review those documents. I know several MPUs will have plenty of opportunities to uh, talk to us planners, uh, want to talk to us planners over specific drafts, and we're more than willing to accommodate those those requests. So there'll be plenty of uh, opportunities for public and view and comment. All right, I think we may have time for one more question, and let's see if we have any of that. Hold on one moment. Okay, are there any specific limitations or additional steps to consider when planning for the area of the city that's home to the Delta Airlines or the airport? So that's, that's a question from Zach again. Um, I know that the, the airport is working on a capital improvement program and actually implementing a capital uh, budget uh, I could see us uh, working more closely with the airport, um, but it's something that for further investigation, how do we how do we do that? But yeah. Thanks, Nate. Last question. I think this is for uh, the commissioner. How do we diversify housing stock without simply allowing larger homes, two massive duplexes? at $1 million each, replacing a single $500,000 house does not generate diversity. Well, you got that right. That's for sure. Who, who, who sent us that question? That's a good one. It was an anonymous question. Ah, you should have took credit, credit for that. <laughs> I'll well, say I sent it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Kidding. So how do we diversify housing stock? You gotta tell us that's what you want. We need you to come out to these meetings 
I need us to record you and all your neighbors saying this. I need you to pick out various development types that show different types of housing. And I need you to show me where that goes. I need everybody to do this. So we're going to have that uh, scheduled meetings here pretty soon. We've got the kickoff meeting on February 29th at 5 p.m. at Greenbrier Mall. It's going to be great. Come on out. And then, Nate, how long till we have the overall schedule? Because we want to make sure we get everybody to come out and talk with us about what development patterns they want for their community. Yeah, we, we're, we have scheduled right now our first community uh, open house March 19th, Tuesday, March 19th, the day after. Uh, I think Leah is going to mention this in the closing slides, the day after our MPU Public Participation Day. Uh, my colleague and I are finalizing, reserving those spaces throughout the city. Again, we're we're going to 12 different NPUs uh, in the mar in the in the months of March and April, and then the 13 others in uh, May and June. So we're wrapping up those confirmations of the first round, and we hope to post uh, those uh, schedules and locations in a week or two on our new uh, website, which just launched again, AtlantaForAll.com. All righty. Well, um, that was really robust discussion. Thank you so much to Commissioner Prince and to um, Nate Hosell, our project manager for Plan A. Thank you so much for being with us tonight to uh, teach this information. This was a really, really good class, especially for a first class. I think this is the first time we've done this class. It's been on the schedule for a few years and for um, several reasons we were unable to produce the class so very glad that we were able to produce it this year um i think i'm going to move on to the next slide one more get it here Maybe. all right samantha i think this one is on you mm -hmm. and I, while, while samantha is uh preparing to go over our upcoming courses and events I do want to point out that if you had a question tonight, we tried to answer as many of the questions as we could. I think we answered just about all of them, except those that weren't relevant to course content or weren't clear. If I sent you a note asking you to clarify your question or encouraged you to ask it at a different class, please do feel free to email us with those questions as well. I would not want anyone to think that we were not answering questions. If we can answer the question, we absolutely will answer the question. So please do feel free to email us. You can email the Plan A team at Plan A at atlantaga.gov or of course visit the website at atlantaforall.com and um, yeah we're happy to answer any other questions that you have sam all right so i maybe she's not hearing me i'll go ahead and go through our upcoming courses and events on February 8th at 6 o'clock p.m., we have the history of our neighborhood planning units. That's a walkthrough um, of our of the, the context for setting up the planning units in 1974. So we'll start a little bit before that and get the context and, and understanding of the um, creation of the MPU system. And then, of course, our Zoning Fundamentals 1 course, I highly, highly highly encourage you to attend that class. I will say this much. If we had 149 people uh, present right now at this class, we need to have at least 149 present at the Zoning Fundamentals 1 class. The only people we'll give passes to are those that have already taken it two or three times. If you've only taken it once, come on back and take it again. Uh, the Zoning Fundamentals 1 class, I think is probably our most highly attended class and for really good reason. It is conducted by our director of the Office of Zoning and Development, who is a walking, talking, breathing zoning, zoning ordinance. Uh, D director Kieta Holmes uh, knows zoning like the back of her hand and teaches that course very, very well. It is also a prerequisite to our Zoning Fundamentals 2, our Zoning Fundamentals Lab, and our new course this year, the Zoning Fundamentals Mobile Workshop. 
So if you would like to take zoning two, three, uh, or the mobile workshop, you have to take zoning fundamentals one. If you are a zoning chairperson, if you are an NPU officer, or if you live in the city of Atlanta and you care about your community, I highly encourage you to register for that class on February 13th. And then of course, our plan A kickoff, as we announced earlier, Thursday, February 29th at five o'clock PM at Greenbrier Mall. Please come on out to the Southwest as we kick off our CDP engagement. We are so excited around here and really looking forward to seeing all of you on Thursday, February 29th. And then um, actually a couple of you had some classes, some questions tonight on uh, class on items that were more relevant to our housing series. So you may have gotten a note from me encouraging you to register for our housing series courses. If you wanna know more about how to reduce your property taxes with homestead tax exemptions and appeals, please do register for that class, which is held March 14th, just in time for the April deadline to submit your uh, homestead tax exemptions and tax appeals. And then we're hosting Public Engagement Day on Monday, March 18th here at City Hall in the atrium, which is just one day before our very first engagement um, session with the MPUs on the Comprehensive Development Plan or the CDP, also known as Plan A. So on Monday, March 18th, we'll be here at City Hall for Public Engagement Day. Uh, it's open to the public, of course. Everyone is invited to come out and attend. And then on Thursday, March 21st, ooh, we have a lot going on in this department. My goodness. Thursday, March 21st, we have a panel discussion called The Inheritance and Legacy of Civic Power, a conversation with Atlanta's NPU trailblazers, featuring some of the legacy leaders of the NPU system and of our neighborhood associations. That's Thursday, March 21st. And the next day we will have um, the legacy continues and at Maynard Jackson High School, where we will be helping the students there um, understand how to carry on the legacy of civic participation and citizen engagement. Lastly, March 28th at six o'clock PM, we have building permits and a cella for beginners. Some of the questions that y'all had here tonight are actually relevant for that class as well. So please do um, register for all of these classes. You can get all the information you need at npuatlanta.org. You can scan here to register for the Plan A kickoff on, again, February 29th. Mm -hmm. more information. More information. For more information, I'm sorry, you don't have to register. Thank you all. No registration necessary, but to get more information, you can scan that QR code and we would love to see you there. Thank you so, so much for being here, all of you. Please do follow us on all the social medias where we get all of our information out about all things DCP, all things NPU, and all things NPU University. You can follow us at NPU Atlanta on Facebook on X, which is formerly known as Twitter, and on Instagram and TikTok. And please note that all of our classes are uploaded onto YouTube. So you can find this class on YouTube, I think in about an hour or so, something like that. Thank you so much. Um, I know that if Samantha's microphone were working, she would strongly encourage you to please take the very, very brief survey. If you've taken our classes before, you know that you can complete the survey in under five minutes, more like two or three minutes, but please do take that survey. It helps us understand uh, the sentiment that you have behind these classes, what we can do to make the classes better, what classes you're interested in having us produce. And of course, when it comes time for us to propose a budget, it helps a lot to be able to have metrics and know that people are attending our classes and learning a lot from them. So please do take the time to complete that survey. Thank you all so much for being here on a Tuesday night. You could have, is it Tuesday? On a Tuesday night, you could have chosen to be anywhere else, but you care that much about your community and about your city and you wanted to spend it with us. I appreciate you so much. Are there any closing comments from Commissioner Prince or Nate Hosell? I would like to thank everybody for being in this meeting. 
and for asking the questions and caring about your community so much. I look forward to seeing you at our comprehensive development plan meetings. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you soon. We'll see you at the next class and then we'll see you at the kickoff, February 29th. Take care, everyone.